All right, so good afternoon again. My name is Renee Justbuddy. Um, I am a senior business analyst in the customer experience group within the Office of Security Operations. Thank you for joining today's reporting feedback system, otherwise known as, known as RFS, expanded data collection testing kickoff call. I am joined today by the subject matter experts um, at Deloitte, as well as the virtual development technical team, who will be here to facilitate today's call, as well as to answer your questions during the Q&A session of today's call. Next slide, please. All right, here is the agenda for today's kickoff call. We're gonna first start off by explaining the benefits and provide some background data for, um, some background for the RFS expanded data collection. Next, we're going to uh, provide you all with a view of the testing or an overview of uh, what testing organizations are and also share the testing timeline followed by a demonstration of the RFS testing resources, where you can find them as well as what needs to happen for each with each of those different testing resources. Then we'll lead over into what are the RFS testing next steps for the testing organizations. Then we're gonna close out of course with the Q&A session. Um, I also, I, I do wanna say that we will be talking uh, for probably about a good 20 or 30 minutes. So before we begin the Q&A session, if you do have a question during while the presentation is happening, feel free to put your question in the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. If you hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A box. You'll also see the chat box. Please refrain from putting your questions in that box please only put your questions in the Q&A box so that in the event our team is not able to answer a question during this call, we're able to track those questions and respond to you offline. Okay, um, I know that most people will ask, will this presentation be made available after today's call? The answer to that is yes. After uh, we've ended today's call, we will post the link in the chat to where you can find the presentation. All right, with all that being said, I will now hand things over to Matt at Deloitte and he is going to take it from here. Matt? Thank you, Renee, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, initially for the RFS expanded data collection, we looked over the background and benefits of this effort. And this entire data collection is designed to enhance additional loan level data elements for Ginny May issuers. This is expanding upon the existing RFS reporting, adding additional uh, loan level elements. We're seeing 11 new data, data elements being collected during this effort. And additionally, we're expanding upon the existing RFS reporting. This isn't changing the monthly RFS reporting flow in any way, but rather adding new additional information, provide additional insights um, to Ginny May and the broader issuer community. With that background and rationale of why we're doing this collection in mind, we'd next like to go into the testing organizations and who will be needing to test these additional data elements during the file testing window. So for the file testing, and this is a couple of key distinctions. First, the testing period is for individuals who submit files. So for issuers who manually enter their information, there'll be additional training later on uh, provided for manual entry issuers. So this is for organizations that submit a file for their RFS information, either through the My Ginny May portal or through the SFTP um, process. In terms of who is required to test, who for this effort we are classifying as a testing organization, there's a few key considerations. First, if you're an issuer that uses a proprietary in-house reporting system or a custom configuration of a um, platform vendor, you are required to test. 
because each of you generates your file in a specific fashion, we wanna make sure Ginny Mae is able to receive and validate that file. So if you fall into the first category here, um, you will need to test during the testing window. Second, for issuers who use service bureaus, and we understand there's a large number who rely on service bureaus for um, their RFS file submission, you are not required to test individually as an issuer, but rather making sure to work with your service bureau to coordinate that process to ensure that you will be able to submit that information when it begins required reporting. So if you're working with the service bureau, we've been in contact with all of the major um, bureaus already. Several have already started submitting test files. As an issuer, you're not required to test directly, but rather recording it through the service bureau. But lastly, all issuers, whether you're working with the service bureau or not, are welcome to test. If you would prefer that you wanna also have the flexibility of generating this file, we invite you to test, invite you to register um, to test. For issuers that have both single family and multifamily portfolios, uh, you'll need to test each of those individually as well. Um, to reiterate at the bottom here, for issuers um, that contract their RFS data to outside organizations like a service bureau, you are not required to test individually, but should work with your service bureau to make sure that everyone is set up for success for RFS additional data elements. With that in mind, we'll next go over the file testing timeline for the RFS additional data elements. And note that this timeline was recently extended as well. So what we're working towards here is come September is when Ginny May is expecting to see um, the RFS expanded data elements begin required reporting. And that required reporting in September of 2024 be using August data. Now to test, uh, you have three options, three testing windows. Um, several organizations have already uh, begun testing here in March in the initial test cycle. So for our three test cycles, you can submit data right now in March um, using January data. Alternatively, for test cycle two, you can submit information in May using February data. Lastly, you also have the option of submitting information in July, testing the month of July using May data. So three different testing cycles designed to provide flexibility based on issuer and a testing organization feedback that we received. You're only required to test in one testing cycle. However, if you opt to test in additional cycles, um, you can notify our team and we're happy to work with you in one or more testing cycles. With that in mind, um, testing the systems are ready. We've begun receiving files, starting to process this information. So the testing window is open. We're expecting that testing to go on through the end of July, uh, allows August for to begin preparing for required reporting come September. But we are uh, ready and able to test. With that in mind, we'd now like to show the supporting resources available for the RFS expanded data collection testing. So I'm gonna stop sharing the presentation and pull up a web browser to show some of the materials that are publicly available on the Ginny May site. Here we are. So I'm on the Ginny May homepage. And what I'm going to do now is navigate to our issuer tab. Navigate to our issuer tab and go to the modernization initiative page. RFS expanded data elements has a modernization initiative page set up, which is designed to provide key information and resources around this effort. It's listed here, at the bottom of the modernization initiative site and click the plus to expand all of this information and as we see here, we have the overview of the initiative itself, originally detailed in APM 2305, describing the collection of these 11 additional and one updated data element, and also provides key contact information for any subsequent questions. In this case, for this 
initiative, contacting AskJennyMay at HUD.gov is the uh, main uh, point of contact. On the screen here, we'll see a number of links. The first being the RFS Expanded Data Timeline. And we click this link here. We'll see the same material that we just viewed um, in the presentation. This is publicly available and posted for everyone to use and reference. So we're all referring to the same calendar. Um, next, on the Modernization Initiative page, we'll see related communications. Uh, the first item here we'll see is the Modernization Bulletin. And the Modernization Bulletin is designed to provide supporting information to the recently released APM. Uh, APM 2403 was uh, published on March 11th and provides the additional details of this new testing window requiring reporting beginning on September 1st, 2024. Within the Modernization Bulletin, we reiterate who the testing organizations are, as well as make reference to the additional manual um, data entry trainings at a later date. Additionally, in the Modernization Bulletin, we detail the abilities to register um, for testing, as well as submitting your test plan. Now, to this point here, the first step for RFS expanded data testing, if you're interested in testing, that is you are generate uh, RFS file in-house, um, you're a service bureau, or also if you'd like to test, the first step and something you're able to do today is to submit the RFS registration form. This registration page is a short questionnaire. It will provide the name of your organization, the primary contact individual, the issuer IDs you're supporting, as well as which type of testing organization you are. And what this initial registration does is signals to our team and the technical team that you're planning and wanting to test for RFS. So this way we can focus additional targeted communications and outreach to you based on your desire to test for RFS. This is step one in the testing process. Step two, if we go back to the modernization bulletin, will be to submit an RFS test plan. The RFS test plan is to ask additional questions and is more technical in nature and is designed to provide our testing teams the technical information they need to make sure that the file you submit is something that they are able to process as well as covering the needed and necessary fields for a successful test. So as we look through the test plan form, once again, you'll be specifying the name of the organization as well as the primary contact person. And one note here, uh, whether you're an issuer or a service bureau, the contact person specified in the test plan is who the testing team will be contacting with any um, questions, uh, approvals, or a follow up throughout this process. Whoever specified here is who the technical team will be working with during the RFS testing. Uh, you also have the ability to specify a backup contact individual, should the other individual be unavailable for this. Um, you'll select whether it's a single family or a multifamily program that you're testing for, provide the issuer IDs um, that you'll be using during testing. The team's also asking to identify the number of records that you plan to submit so they can gauge if that's an adequate sample or covering all the required fields. Um, you'll specify how you plan to submit your file, either through SFTP, the MyGini may upload, as well as select which testing cycles um, you're planning to test in. So this is a select one or more question. So if you're planning to test in all three cycles, you would check all three of these boxes here. Lastly, for the test data requirements, this provides a field-by-field -field overview where you can comment on any changes or considerations that you have as you're putting your data together. Um, for instance, if you're not able to provide a specific field or you have another concern, you can note it for the corresponding field, what that concern is, and the testing team will review this and look that over to make sure that you are ready and able to test. Going back to our modernization bulletin, that's where these two links are. These two links are also in the presentation from today. And then we also, again, provide the timeline here. 
So we've gone over the modernization bulletin. We've spoken to the APMs. Both are posted here. The next item to note is Appendix 619. Appendix 619 is what's specifying the file format needed for the new RFS expanded data effort. The one piece to note with this appendix, it's currently posted on the modernization initiative site, as well as with APM 2403, is that this has a future effective date of September 1st, 2024. So for Ginny May, this is where this latest appendix 619 is hosted. And this is what's providing the specifications that all testing organizations should use when preparing their RFS expanded data files. Lastly, on the RFS initiative page, we see here testing organization instructions. This is a key reference document um, for all organizations testing, specifying exactly what's needed to test. This will walk through step-by-step, step, um, again, who the testing organizations are, the scope of the testing needed, clarifying the uh, reporting period specific windows, um, specifying the need to register for testing. And again, we saw those registration links in the modernization bulletin, as well as in this presentation, um, talking about the test plan, what's required there, um, how to prepare for testing and the preparation instructions. So for instance, during testing, this needs to be based on production data is one of the elements that the testing team will be checking against. So if you're deviating from that production data, that should be noted in your test plan. We specify the test data set requirements of what needs to be provided to make sure that all required information is populated in the test file submission. Uh, we see it spelled out for both single family and multifamily. We also see the naming convention. How should the file be named? Um, there's a specific convention. So for each test cycle, it'll be named based off of the cycle and then the issuer ID. Um, providing examples of how that should be completed. And this is how we'll recognize which file um, is being submitted. We provide details for the file submission, as well as clarifying the testing window, uh, noting uh, what times uh, the test window will be open during those business days, during the testing months as well. And lastly, provide details of how we'll provide feedback so once the team processes it, the testing will be in contact with you, either approving the file or reaching out with any questions or the identified exceptions will be messaged back to that contact person specified in the test plan. Um, talking about Google Live reporting, as well as specifying here in Appendix A, which fields are expected. So for instance, we're expecting uh, fields from the L record, as well as several fields from the V record for RFS testing. With that in mind, that brings us to the end of the testing instructions. We return to the modernization initiative page. We also see several other resources here um, to help support you. Um, these include the past modernization uh, issuer outreach calls and related materials, as well as a frequently asked questions document that goes over some questions that the team has received to date. With that in mind, I'm going to go back and return to the PowerPoint presentation. And continue our presentation. All right, so we spoke to all of these uh, items here the registration form, the test plan. These links are directly to um, the survey tool as well as those testing instructions. Moving on to the next slide uh, for testing next steps. Uh, what we encourage all um, attendees to do is to review APM 2403, which is what's specifying um, the RFS expanded data collection effort, as well as what's requiring that September 1st, a required go live, go live date 
as well as providing the updated Appendix 619 with the new file layout. Uh, we just went through Modernization Bulletin number 39, provides those additional details and resources on um, that process, as well as going through the testing instructions. So if you are an organization planning to test, that test instruction document provides a lot of key information you need to prepare and submit your file. In terms of next steps for all testing organizations, uh, the first piece you can do, and this is something you're able to do today, is submit that test registration form. That again, just lets our team know that you're planning to test um, for RFS expanded data. Um, from there, once you have your technical information together of what you're hoping to test, go ahead and submit your test plan. Uh, this way we can review it and approve it, answer any questions that you may have um, as that file is submitted. Links for each of those are in Modernization Bulletin 39, as well as on the previous slide of this presentation. The key next step here, once your test plan is submitted, is to wait for approval from our testing team. They'll write out back to you if there's any questions or clarifications, help answer those questions. And once you're approved, then and only then uh, would you submit your test file. Um, if you submit a file without a test plan, the team's not able to process it because they're not sure if there's any considerations or exceptions to be looking for. So the test plan approval is that key step before submitting that test file. And then from there, begin testing in one of the three testing cycles. Um, lastly, um, for all organizations, uh, to prepare for go live reporting in September 2024 using your August 2024 data. Uh, we've gone over uh, the RFS expanded data effort, all the available testing materials. Um, so next we'd like to open this to question and answer, and I'll pass it back to Renee to help facilitate that Q&A discussion. Thank you, Matt. Great job. Um, so I did see that there were several questions that have come through in the Q&A. Um, and before we do get things kicked off there, I do wanna reiterate, um, that if you fall into either of the three categories, if you can go back to the definition of what a testing organization is, so that slide, I believe it's slide two. I just wanna reiterate, I know that Matt said a few times if you would like to test, um, that option of testing if you would like only applies to issuers, um, who desire to test if you have a service bureau that tests on your behalf or those manual entry um, organizations. So again, if you fall into the first two items here with the check marks next to them, issuers who use a proprietary in-house monthly reporting software or a custom configuration of a service bureau's monthly reporting file, you are required to test as well as any issuers who use a service bureau or other providers for monthly reporting software. Just wanted to make sure that's clear. Um, that those are who the testing organizations are. And if you fall into that category, then you are required to test during one of those three testing cycles. Okay, if we can go back to the Q&A slide, there are three different ways that you can participate in the Q&A session. If you dialed in from your computer, you can simply hover down at the bottom of your screen by the reactions uh, button, and you can select the raise hand icon and we will uh, know to, that you have a question. We just ask that you first unmute yourself so that you can begin to speak. Second, if you dialed in from your phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand and that will indicate that you have a question. And the host will read the last four digits of your phone number and you will select star six to unmute yourself before speaking. If you prefer to not ask your question aloud, you can simply type your question in the Q&A section of the webinar um, in the Q&A box, as I mentioned at the top of the call. So um, I'm gonna first start, I know that there were a couple of questions that were asked early on. Um, so I'll start off reading those through those first um, and the, the responses. But before I do that, um, I need to ask Tyler if there are any hands raised. Yes, William has his hand raised. Okay, so William, um, we'll go to you first before I begin reading the questions in the Q&A box. Please 
please make sure to unmute yourself so that you can speak. Tyler, were you able to unmute him so that way he can uh, unmute himself? Yes, give me one second, Renee. Okay. Mm -hmm. How are we doing? I just, Off mute. Just okay. like that. I raised yeah. my hand an hour. I apologize for that. Oh, okay. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> nice to hear your voice. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. So our first question um, was regarding question three of the registration. So can we go back to the um, registration form, please? Yes. And the question is, um, Carla at, says that they are uh, a software vendor, not a service bureau. Do they only need to list the issuer number for the client whose data they are using for the test file? Um, because they don't list issuer numbers of Ginny Mae customers ut utilizing their software. So this is regarding question number three right here. Please list the Ginny Mae issuer ID your organization supports for RFS file upload. The answer to Carla's question is correct. You will only list the issuer number you are using for testing. Okay. Um, the next question is for section nine of the test plan. Oh, we can we can leave off of um, this screen. For section nine of the test plan, is this where you'd reference the unique loan ID pool? I'm sorry, the unique loan ID or pool ID of records that are different between, between production and test file? The answer to that is the pool ID and Ginny May unique loan ID must match production data. The next question is from Karen Schneider. And she would like to know if we have tested and the file upload is good, and the file is good, can we start using the expanded uh, file prior to September? And the answer is no, the new file layout will not be accepted until September, 2024. Our next question is, is there any leeway on the March 29th, 2024 date? If you're still working out exceptions on this date, are we able to continue working, clearing these after March 29th, or will we have to wait for a new, a new uh, test process in May using February da data? The answer to that is depending on the circumstance, uh, VDEV will do their best to support you in achieving a successful test. So um, you may, if, if you are having, if you have any additional questions or any follow-on questions um, to that answer or to that question that was from anonymous, an anonymous attendee, if um, you'd like for additional information, please submit your, uh, uh, your email your questions rather to the ashinimeahud.gov mailbox if you'd like a little bit more information um, to support your question. The next question is from Carla. Thanks Carla for all your questions, appreciate you. Um, and her question is, do we need to include various loan, various record in test file for every pool? And the answer to that is yes. If you are reporting as a multifamily issuer, then you need to supply field 26, servicer slash subservicer ID of the V loan record. For a single family, what will be needed is field 27 document custodian ID and field 26 servicer slash sub subservicer ID. And of course, you'll also need to supply field one for record type, field two for unique loan ID, and field three for pool ID. Um, so, Carla, I did see that that response was resp uh, was provided um, in text. So, if you want to screenshot that or copy and paste that, so that way you have that information, um, please feel free. Oh well, I don't know if we can. Oh, we can. If you need that information, in, in, um, 
readily available to you, you can shoot an email to ashtonimeahud.gov and we can reiterate that in an email to you so you have that information on hand. All right. Okay, a um, couple more questions, quite a few more questions. Uh, Jeremy asks, says that his bank's core software is FIS and they, um, they have all loan data and it sends all data to Jenny Mae each month. We, meaning Jeremy's team, do nothing when it comes to sending data. So the question is, are they to do this work or assume or hope that FIS will do the testing and work for them? The only thing that their team does is check everything throughout the month to make sure it's working. And so far it's been great. They've only been doing Ginny Mae loans for a year now. So that question is for the technical team. Can someone come off mute and answer that question? Can someone from our team? I don't know if that would be you, Mike. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, so, um, Jeremy uh, and and Matt, maybe we can set up a call with you guys, and we can help you through that. Uh, we're we're gonna need to either work for, with one of your customers as well, but let's get a call, Matt, with FIS, and we can uh, kind of get through that. Absolutely, we'll make a note of that, and we'll follow up with you. Well, Matt, Matt FIS is one that we should be having a call with next week. Yes, that is correct as well. So we're, we're already in contact with FIS and then Jeremy, I understand you're using them for your processing. So we'll we'll get more information and make sure to follow up with you as soon as possible. All right, thanks team. All right, our next question is, if data is constructed for a mandatory field, for an example, field 25 removal reason uh, for multifamily, should we only add that data or related field data like removal data or removal date. Yeah, Renee, this is Rick. Um, the data should be functionally complete. So you should include the other fields to make that record complete. All right, Mr. Patel, if that answers your question, can you give us a thumbs up? If not, you can ask a clarifying question um, in the Q&A box. Okay, our next question. Will a new 11710E form be provided? Christy, Rick, you, one of you guys want to take Yeah, that? this is this is Rick. Um, the 11 tab, the 10 E form is currently only a reference form. Uh, the transaction is electronic on the L record. So the answer is no. I, I don't know of any plans Jenny May has to update that reference form. Now, I don't know if Nana, if Nana's on, we might take it back as, but uh, Nana, there's a, there, been nothing because it's a, it's a reference form that's not used explicitly. Right. And Rick, also one thing in training that we talk about with the 11710E is since it is only a reference form, the actual HUD 11710E, as long as the issuers have an equivalent of that form, like in exactly. their servicing system or one that they build in Excel, however it is that they maintain their data, that is how the issuers would need to, to have that form for audit purposes. That's right. So they would update your own internal output of the, of the 10E equivalent. Okay, great. Thank you. Next question is, when registering, is there a key of definition guide for the number of records we can expect for P, L, V, and S? We, we don't have a, a specified minimum number of records that we expect. Um, if you're an issuer, it depends on your portfolio. Um, we want you to submit what you think is a, a good reflection of the portfolio you have. If you want to report it all, that's fine. We can handle it. All 
Okay, thank you very much. Next question is where would where would they submit their files? So um, there are two ways to submit, and it 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 will follow how you submit your files today. Uh, if you're a MyGenieMay user and your organization uploads their file through MyGenieMay today, uh, you will do you will do the same for this test. Uh, there is a, a new um, uh, uh, menu item, menu item uh, that you will select a TP test, I believe it's referred to as, and that will allow you to update it. If your um, organization submits it through Secure, secure, T, secure FTP, um, they will submit it through a, a, a new Secure FTP server. And I believe we got that information out to everybody. It, it's on the uh, the website. You said that information is on the website. Um, it's I believe on some of it is. If, if you're yeah, if you're if you are a secure FTP user today and you're going to submit it, um, you can send. Um, uh, is it a Christy? What's the uh, the appropriate term for? Asking questions to the askjennymayadha.gov. Ask yeah. or, or could they also put that on their test plan? It'll be on the test plan. They select SFTP. We'll follow up with that information that you need to submit your file when your test yeah. plan is approved. Yep. Thank you. All right. Next question Will there be additional training sessions held by Jenny May as we go through testing months? Um, would anyone from the team like to take that? Christy, we just, you want to take that? We just, there's a whole, uh, there's a lot of things going to happen that you'll be able to participate in. But Christy, do you want to talk about the different types of things will be available to them? Well, for, for RFS, I believe we will be having a webinar. Yes. And correct. a date for that, yes, correct. So once um, the date has been established for the webinar, uh, a training announcement will be published to the JennyMay.gov website and a subscription notification will be sent to everyone who has uh, subscribed to receive email notifications from Jenny May that will um, allow you to, that will announce that the training um, is when it's being taken place and how you can register for the webinar. So you will receive information well in advance of the webinar. So stay tuned for that. And Renee, aren't training also posted in e-notification? Yes. An e-notification and a MyGDMA portal message will be sent along with the, subscrip the subscription email. Great question. I love it that you guys want more information. <laughs> um, next question, how long will it take for Jenny May to review and approve the test plans? Great question. Yeah, we, we, we are doing our best to get them out to you uh, within 24 hours. It may take a day longer, just depending on the volume we get in, but um, you know, we've been able to get the, the eight or 10 we looked at so far, we've been able to get them back in the day. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Oh, Lisa says that you will respond to our email that you received approval. Um, Lisa, I'm a little confused. Can you, you want to come off? So I'm assuming okay. you're talking about once you receive an approval email, you'll let us. Renee, know. that was a follow-up to a previous question she had okay. in the chat that Mike had helped address. Okay, got it. Got it, got it. Um, okay, so someone said, apologies, they joined late, but is this for servicing? Yes, okay. this would be for investor reporting, not for pool securitization. Yeah, and, and but be clear, it's not, it's not servicing per se. It, it's Jenny May investor reporting, monthly reporting. So hopefully that helps. That was from an anonymous attendee. If um, you have any clarifying questions or if you have any follow-up questions, please put them in the Q&A box or send them to askjennymay at hud.gov. 
Next question, is there any change in IOPP scorecard metrics due to expansion of RFS expanded data field? Uh, this is Rick. There, there are none uh, that I'm aware of. Matt, we could take that back, but uh, so far I've not seen any requirements for changes to the IOPP scorecard. There are some additional RFS exceptions with these data elements, and my, uh, those will flow to IOPP, but I don't think they're changing the scorecard. They're just exceptions per usual. So would you like to get back to Sadesh or are you confident with the response? Or are you comfortable with the response? Yeah, I think Renee, the answer is no. Um, if we do find, if there is something, there'll be an update through IOPP. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, next question. If we only have if we only currently updated the header, pool, loan, and trailer data, does that mean we only need to make updates to the loan data, i.e. add additional columns 38 or 30 through 38? Uh, no, Donna, for this test, uh, we do require you to report a various record. Uh, the sensitive record you don't have, that's optional, but you, you need to add in the sensitive data. And I think we answered the question. There's some fields. Twenty. If you're multifamily, it's you. Uh, let me look at it again. The subservicer ID, um, servicer ID, uh, and if you're single family, you have to report subservicer ID, sub servicer ID if you have one, uh, and the document custodian ID. Once we this does when it does go into production, when we we are asking you uh, to port monthly, I guess it would be September two thousand twenty four. That first month, you will have to report uh, a various record for every loan, so we can see it. It would have to um, include that document custodian ID if you're a single fam if it's a single family loan, and subservicer servicer ID if appropriate. Multifamily, we're looking for the subserver service or ID if it's appropriate. Thank you. Um, next question. Will participants receive text exception results? If so, how will those results be shared? Yes, you will. If, if we find exceptions with your data, uh, we will be emailing them to you, letting you know what we found. Uh, if we find your data to be acceptable, you'll be receiving an email from us saying that we find your data acceptable and you pass the test. Thank you. Next question is, um, are the RFS requirement changes final or do we expect changes in to the requirements before it goes live? Uh, the changes are final. We don't expect anything in addition to what um, we put out. Thank you. Next question is, what can we expect in terms of feedback on the testing file? Exception report 11710, other files would, um, would download and review? Yeah, Nick, this will look very similar to the exception, exception file you get today. Um, we... Uh, uh, we'll be sending out, it, it'll be, hopefully, there, it'll be a small file, but uh, we it'll look just like the one you have today. And Mike, again, it'll be emailed back. That is correct. Yeah. Thank you. All right, next question. Um, Carla wants to know, is submission of sensitive records optional? Correct. It is optional. You do not have to send in sec sensitive records. Okay, next question is from Karen. She wants to know, um, they currently do not include the S or V fields in their current RFS file. Um, is it necessary for the test file? Please confirm or clarify. As I said before, the S um, the sensitive record is optional. You don't have to supply one of those records, but the V, uh, the various 
record layout. We do need that. Um, the uh, uh, multifamily, uh, once again, it would be the um, service or subservice or ID field, if you have it. And the um, uh, for single family, service or subservice or ID, and of, and of course, the document custodian ID. Thank you. Um, okay, next question. Newbar says, are the expectations going to be delivered in the same style as typically, uh, as typical multifamily Jenny May exceptions? For example, are they getting expected values? Yes. However, you'll be getting the be getting them in an email. We will send them to the contact person listed on the test plan. But they will follow the, the, the same same structure as you see exceptions today. Right. So some exceptions do not have the expected values. So that will be the same, just like Mike stated. Thank you. Okay, next question. Can we be included in the updates regarding FICS? Um, they also use FICS as a servicing system for reporting. Yeah, the previous uh, question was from FIS, which is another uh, service bureau. Um, but if you have specific questions with FICS, we encourage you to contact them. I can also set up time with you if you'd like. So FICS and FIS are two different vendors. Thanks, Matt. Um, next question is from Gerald. When sending the test data for single family issuer, does it need to be exactly like production data or can it be production like? Well, there, there are certain elements that have to be production data. Um, you know, issuer ID, uh, pool ID, uh, Ginny May loan ID. And if there are other elements that um, you're you're going to change, modify for testing. That's where we would like you to note it in your test plan, so we can review it and see if it if it's going to be acceptable or not. Yeah, and Mike, one other thing to note: if you depart from from production data, as Mike said, the the loan ID, the pool ID, but if you depart with the other data values, um be careful because it will trigger other RFS exceptions and you'll get a lot of exception feedback, a lot of noise. So it should be functionally complete. If you're gonna use a different OPB, UPB interest rate, then the FIC should be consistent and so on. It, it, so I would just say in general, be careful about the parting, make sure the data is still you know, functionally complete, if you will. Okay. Um, I understand that there's a hand raised. Uh, do we have any hands raised on the phone, Tyler? Or on the there, there were three, but there are none now. Renee. All right. Sorry about that. I I scrolled down and, and saw that there was someone with a hand raised, and I just saw it. Um, if you still want to ask your question, feels please feel free to re-raise your hand, and we'll call on you. Yep. You have Carla raising your hand right now. Okay. Carla, you are good to go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So going back to the differences, like, um, so if we're submitting, if our production data didn't have a curtailment, um, but we are responsible to include like the cur new curtailment code in the file, obviously we need to select a loan in the test file to post a curtailment which then is gonna impact a bunch of other fields as well as the curtailment amount and the curtailment code. So I missed the part where you said where we should document that in the test plan. Yes, in the test plan, um, by each data element for each record, you'll see there is a, a column basically, and for each field- Okay, you can, you so can in that section that. nine. Yeah, and following your logic there, I think you're going there. Where you'll have to make changes to like, you know, the uh, UPB and some other fields just to make it all go into line. Right. Yeah. So that's what Rick was trying to explain. Be very careful there. 
to make sure that we're referencing each field where there's going to be a difference. Right. And then if you're going okay. to do the example you gave, if you're going to do that, just make sure it flows through to the other values that would be affected by a curtailment. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then Bobna also has her hand raised. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had the same question as Carla had. Um, so we'll notify in the test plan of any exceptions from the production data because we are using constructed data uh, specifically for curtailment code um, and amount. So we'll list that in the test plan, right? We correct, correct. Yeah, okay. that's, okay. that's exactly right. And just like we were, we were talking to Carla, you know, make sure if you're going to have a curtailment, it, it impacts other fields that you'll uh, be reporting. Yeah. Thank you. And my second question is that, uh, like previously, as previously Carla asked, so with, um, same in the test plan, my anticipated volume of records um, section should have same number of P records, L records, and V records. Is that correct? Well, the V records, you don't, it doesn't have to have the same number. Okay. So like if you had, you're reporting 100,000 L records, mm -hmm. you don't have to report 100,000 V records, um, but we would, uh, like to have an, a good sample for the test of the records. Perfect. That makes sense. Uh, so thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, we have six more minutes left, so I'm going to try to get through as many questions as I can. Um, some of the some of the folks on the team are going to be responding to you directly in the Q and A box, so that way we can try to make sure we get to everyone's questions. Um, all right, next question is for manual entry testing will be presented at a different time? Yeah, so um, we've already tested the system. It's all ready to go, but we'll be providing training for how to use the online part of it. And I think, help me, Chris, you and Renee, when we were, that's scheduled for later on, correct? Correct. Before it goes live in September, we're looking around August to host that training. Because currently the testing is only focused on those files. So you manually enter, there's no front end testing. We do training on the manual entry as well as going through the MyGenieMA portal to clear or resolve exceptions prior to go live in September. Yeah, that's correct. And a, and a, um, and a training announcement will be published so that you are able to um, register for that training event. Okay. Um, the next question is, uh, are we on time to test by March 29th if we submit RFS registration form today? Oh, we'll be ready to accept your file. Thank you. I'm sorry, I got... Oh, okay. No, he wanted to know. They wanted to know if they, if they submit their registration form today, Will they be on time to um, submit their test information for March 29th? Yeah, so hopefully you can get it in before March 29th, but uh, uh, we we are ready for you. If you send your plan in, we'll review it, get it back to you as quickly as possible. And uh, you know, then it's up to you to send the file. Thank you. Um, and I know that some folks may have to drop off, so, I'm going to ask that before you leave the call, we do have a post training survey that we would like for you to complete. So if I can have Tyler, you post that in the chat for everyone. Um, before leaving today's call, please do fill out the, the uh, survey so that we can get your feedback on how today's session went so that way we can improve on future sessions. Um, all right, so next question is, Currently on our RFS file, we only report P and L data sets. Are we required to test V and S data sets? They would like to just load dummy data for V and S settings. 
So um, S, S, S record, the sensitive record is, is not required, so you don't need to report that. For the V record, um, as I stated before, there are some fields that have to match production, issuer pool, uh, loan ID. Um, and then for your, um, uh, if you're single family, the document custodian ID and the um, service or subservicer, uh, please, you're going to get a lot of exceptions if you don't report valid numbers there. Right. And also all the fields in between, like the min number or, you know, the buy down code, those fields do not have to be reported on the test file or in your production file because the V record should only be the new data or if something changes. All right, thank you. Um, okay, next question is currently, uh, oh, nope, that was, we just answered that one. Um, Lisa asked, is the go live date of September 24, 100%? Yes, if not, when we know for sure live date, no, yes, that September 24 date is guaranteed as specified in the APM, um, APM 2403. Next question. Um, this person says, we currently do not include the S or V fields in their current current RFS file. Um, is, is it necessary for the test file? I think we just answered that, but can you just shed some light on that again, please? Yes, the, so the S is optional, uh, but the V, you have to supply some V records for this testing process. Thank you. So, okay, so next question is, in the anticipated volume of records, the P records, L records, and V records should be the same number of records? Uh, no, uh, they don't have to be. Uh, if, if you're a single family, uh, if you have a single fa family portfolio, uh, your P records won't be the same, typ typically won't be the same as your L records. And the, uh, how you can report a V record for every loan that you report. You don't have to, um, but we do want a, a good sample of V records uh, for this test if you decide not to send a record for every loan record, a V record for every loan record. Okay, um, Bobna has another question. He says for multi, or they say, I'm sorry, for multifamily, if they construct curtailment principal code, do they need to construct the curtailment principal amount in field 20 and also change current UPB accordingly? Yes. Thank you. And uh, next question is, not sure if this is relevant, what is claim funds curtailment? Does this refer to collection, collections received under partial claim modification? Christy or Matt? Or uh, we'll, we'll get back to you on that. I mean, in general, yes, it is claim funds collected. All right. All right. <clears throat> yes, it the team will get back to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Next well, question. Rick, Rick answered it. So. Oh, okay. Thanks, Rick. Um, okay, I know we're at time, but we just have three more questions. If you'd like to hold tight, uh, question is Bill 35 curtailment principal code. How are values one, two, and three defined? There are actually four fields in that and they are defined in appendix 6-19. That is on the website that Matt showed earlier. Okay. Fran asks, after the initial reporting of the V file in September 24, is it required to be contained in each monthly submission going forward? <clears throat> Only if there are changes to that data on the V record. So if, it, if you know, you have no changes to any of your, if any of your loans don't, all your loans don't change, in terms of the information that are on that's on the V record, then no, you don't have to report the V record. However, if there are changes, like you change, say, document custodian from one period to the next, 
then yeah, you would have to report the new document custodian ID in the B file. Thank you very much. And last question from Matthew Dolan. To confirm and normal reporting as of now, only V record changes are reported, but for the first month of the new expanded data elements, we will need to have every loan with a V record with the new data elements to be reported, not all V record data elements. That is correct. All right, we had one more pop in. They are saying that they're switching to a new servicing system in May or June. How will we be able to test the RFS file that is generated from our from their new servicing system. Who is your new servicing system? Um, this is from an anonymous attendee. So, um, if you would like to for to get more information, it sounds like you may need a oh mortgage flex. There we go. <laughs> um, I am not familiar with mortgage flex. So yeah, it may be better for uh, this to be taken offline. Yes. So if you can send an email to askjennymay at hud.gov, uh, then the folks uh, from the technical team, Christy and, and Mike and um, and um, Rick will be able to get back to you and, and help you through that, that okay? And then uh, Bhavna had one more confirmation. He just said for construct, for constructed removal code testing, should the UPB be 0, 0.00? Um, I'm not sure what you mean, Bhavna, with the uh, removal code testing. Can Can you come off mute, please? Yeah, or the quick, another quick way, if it's a liquidation, if this is the liquidation question, the UPB should report it. 619 does cover this. UPB should be reported as whatever the UPB is. Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. We have, uh, we're, we're four minutes over time and I see Leslie that you just put um, out here that you are going live with Black Knight. If you have any um, questions regarding uh, that have to deal with your concerns, rather questions, concerns, comments regarding your vendor, um, I believe we suggest, well, I'll let the team respond to that as far as what they should do if they have inquiries regarding their subservicer. Yeah, you're going down the right path, Renee. Uh, you should reach out to Black Knight to get to find out where they are, but just for your information, We've been working with Black Knight for several months now, and we know they are planning to test with us. Um, uh, they haven't finalized with us the timing, but uh, uh, it's all in the works. Okay. Um, there are no more questions in the Q&A. Uh, are there any hands raised, Tyler? I know we're three, five minutes over. Um, just want to make sure that we're getting everybody that we can. I know we're, you know, thanks folks for hanging out late. Don't forget to complete the survey. Really appreciate it. From all of these questions and answers, it sounds like we may have to do, or we will need to do um, another session. Um, but for now, if you have any questions that did not get answered during today's call, please send them to the Ask Jenny May at hud.gov mailbox. And we'll make sure that our team does respond to you in a timely manner. Um, Thanks, Matt just said, thank you. Um, oh, we got one more, just to confirm, recording uh, regarding the V record, when the new data elements are required starting September, are we now required to report V records on every single loan going forward? Uh, no. We covered this before and uh, the, the answer is no, the V record is only when the data on the V record changes, you need to report that V record. So, and then also for new issuances. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, um, okay, that covers it. Okay, well, um, thanks everyone for joining today's call. Um, I am putting a link to today's kickoff presentation um, in the chat. The recording will be made available um, 
either sometime later this week or first thing next week and a notification will be sent from ginnymay.gov subscription email once it's published or the website. But for now, again, if you have any questions that weren't able to get asked during today's call, please send them to askginnymay.hud.gov. Uh, feel free to review, uh, take a look back at the presentation that was shared during today's call by clicking on the link provided here in the chat. Um, thank you everyone so much for attending today's call and we look forward to hearing from you soon and happy testing. Bye-bye.